Hello, Doctor. Welcome to the Navin Times show and thank you very much for coming on our show. Thank you very much. Uh, Doctor, you are an orthopedic surgeon and that is, uh, you know, that is what we know about you. But I'm sure there is much more to know about your training, a little bit about your academic um, achievements. Well, uh, for any orthopedic surgeon, we just really need to go to a very rigorous training. And uh, it was not an exception for me. So I trained, did my basic training in Goa Medical College. All right. I did my Master of Surgery through Government of uh, uh, Medical College, uh, Department of Orthopedics. In after, Goa itself. In Goa itself, right. in Goa Medical College. And after that, I did my DNB, which is a diplomat of the National Board in, from Bombay. And uh, then I proceeded uh, to UK to complete my Royal College training. Uh, so I have done this. And besides this, I have also done uh, lots of fellowships. Because once you've completed your postgraduate training, you need to specialize in certain areas. Right. So I did my fellowships in joint replacement surgeries, arthroscopy, and sports injuries. Okay. And, and very recently, uh, maybe about 10, 15 years back, I had also completed my fellowship in foot and ankle surgery. So you are all the time learning new things because there are so many, uh, you know, um, new things happening in the, in the field. So you basically need to keep yourself updated. That's yes. That's I think for any professional, you just need to do that so that you try and give the best to your patients. Right. So it's not with a choice, but you have to do it. Uh, you know, willingly because at the end of the day, the technology is changing so fast. I know. Every six months, you've got new treatments, and today the patients also are demanding for the latest treatments. So right. you need to be one step ahead. Of course. So I think uh, it's very essential that every profession in any field needs to keep himself updated. Right, doctor. You have been um, in this field. You have been practicing for about twenty-five years. Yes. That's a long time. Yes. Very, okay. Uh, in the last 25 years, I mean, from the time you've started to today, what, what are the ailments, what are the complaints that have been recurring? In fact, have become more right now. What do you yeah, think? That's a very good question. I think uh, what's happening in the last 25 years, actually the process of change has always been there. But what I have noticed in my practice is that more younger patients are coming with the problems that would have probably come in their 50s and 60s. Say a simple, I'll give you a simple example of back pain. I mean, today you see uh, a back pain patient is usually in the age group between 20 to 40, because these are the people who are, uh, you know, not taking care of themselves. Their lifestyle is horrible. I mean, they have, uh, they work hard, but they don't give any time for their body. So it's like they don't take care of their body weight. They don't exercise. They don't watch what they're eating and their sleeping habits. Everything is uh, haywire. Right. So that reflects on the back pains and the neck pain. Now you have this uh, tech neck, which is using a lot of mobiles. You get patients with lots of neck pains and sh shoulder pains. So I think it's a uh, lot of the orthopedic problems that you see nowadays are lifestyle Lifestyle disorders. related. So they're not really something that would have occurred otherwise. So I think uh, lifestyle has made a big impact on I, I think so. In fact, you know, from the time we started in the month of May, our talks, we've had a lot of experts in, health, in the health field who have come here and most of them are saying that the incidence of all the conditions, the illnesses that they are seeing are much more you know, today than they were a um, few years ago, maybe even 10 years or 15 years ago. So you are right. Doctor, your area of expertise is um, yeah, so I am basically uh, started as a general orthopedic surgeon, but then I specialized in joint replacement surgery. So that was my first area of uh, expertise. So what is joint replacement surgery is basically when the joints are worn out, whether it's the hip joint, the knee joint, the shoulder joint, or the elbow joint. These are the joints that are most commonly replaced. So you need to really train yourself because it's not just replacing the joints, but you also need to revise these joints once they fail after 15, 20 years. So you have a primary replacement and you have a revision replacement. So that was my first area of interest. Besides that, I treat sports injuries. Right. And uh, also I treat a lot of foot and ankle problems. In fact, uh, I have um, been uh, offered the prestigious post of the president of the Indian Foot and Ankle Society. And I'm taking over as the president in the August. Oh, congratulations. Year. Thank wow. You. This we is are, a subspecialty. We, we really are, all our viewers, I'm sure, agree with me. We're really honored that, you know, to have you in our, in our studio and sharing so much of your knowledge with us. You said something about the 
the replacement that you said initial uh, surgery and then you said that there is revision. some revision w yeah. what is that so basically you have to understand that any surgical procedure like a primary joint replacement has a lifespan so suppose you operate on a patient at the age of 55 or 60 right in the matter of say 10 years 15 years for some reason the joint wears out maybe because of the poor bone quality or you know the patient being overweight or some other accident that has happened you need to go back and re put that joint again now the situation is not as good as it was primarily so you need more complex implants so more difficult techniques so that you know you get the patient back on a function so right. primary joint replacements and revision so revision is you go back and redo it now that's really a much tougher job so you need to again train yourself to do that okay now you said normally suppose someone has a um, knee replacement when they are 50 and then you're saying another 15 20 years down the line they have to do it again so are the patients i mean are the patients very open to at 65 or 70 you know saying okay i want to do my uh, surgery i wouldn't be able to answer that question in very clear cut uh, right yeah but right. the thing is that we prepare the patients on day one that okay. if you leave long enough you are going to probably need another one if you do it early. So it all depends on w what age you do it. So it doesn't mean that you st only operate on patients 65 plus. There are patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are 35, 40, and even those patients undergo. And if they live 15, 20 years, there is a very good chance that this joint is going to. It's like a p changing a tire. Yes. I mean, every tire has a lifespan, and so right. it runs that 40,000 kilometers. You need to go and put a new one if there is a trouble. Right. Similarly, with the joint replacement, if there is a problem and these joints can be replaced again and with a normal function so right. it's 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 not uh, it's not difficult but you know it's it's uh, something okay. that has been done routinely all over the world now. okay uh, you said something about rheumatoid arthritis yes. now this is one question i've always wanted to ask a sur orthopedic surgeon what is the difference between rheumatism and arthritis because I thought they are different. <coughs> so rheumatism basically is a very uh, waste basket diagnosis. It really doesn't tell you anything. You know, it, rheumatism is a very layman type of a word. It's right. In medical terminology, it has got no, it doesn't tell you a particular thing. Okay. Now, as far as arthritis is concerned, the, the word arthritis itself means inflammation of the joint. Now, right. Inflammation of the joint can occur because of age-related wear. You know, just the aging process itself can cause osteoarthritis. Then you have the inflammation which can occur in the blood and then get affecting the joints, which is called as rheumatoid arthritis. Now this rheumatoid arthritis is the more severe type of arthritis and it uh, sort of progresses very rapidly. So we need to make a diagnosis much earlier, whereas osteoarthritis is a very slowly evolving disease. So these are the basic two types of arthritis. Besides that, you can get arthritis because of infection, you can get because of uric acid problems. So anything that causes inflammation in the joints or causes an infection in the joint will damage the joint. So our right. job is to limit that damage and if we can completely eliminate that, it's good enough. But sometimes the damage is so bad that sometimes the joint gets damaged and we need to replace that joint. Okay, okay. So what you're s telling me is rheumatism is an umbrella term yes. at, under which we have yes. osteoporosis and arthritis. Yes, so any joint like related pain, the patient would say I've got a rheumatic pain, you know. Okay. Anything in and around the joint is a rheumatic pain. I see. All right. Um, I remember uh, I had consulted you a few years ago and I kept telling you that, you know, I'm getting, and this was about 10, 12 years ago, and I said my knees were hurting and you said, uh, you know, this is um, the beginning of osteoarthritis, I think you said. Yes. And I was just wondering, I mean, you know, at such a young age, at then, uh, you said something like that. I'm, I'm sure there are patients so, like that who must have got really terrified yes. listening to, oh my God, I've got, oh, you know, yeah. tried this and th that, so, that's so you know, much. We should not get affected by the diagnosis per se. You know, every patient expects a diagnosis. So if you have uh, a painful knee and the x-ray shows certain changes, then we have to classify it as a particular. It's like saying, I've got cervical spondylosis. The cervical spondylosis is not like a death sentence. It's like saying that, okay, you've got some gray hair or you've got some wrinkled skin, it's part of degenerative process. Now, if it happens very early in the age, it's a problem. But if it occurs 55, 60 plus, 
it we would say it is a age related w- problem what are you talking about you're talking about the spondylosis or you're talking about Either. the osteo- now okay. both of them as well as arthritis as well as your neck pain now the neck pains and the back pains you see much earlier yes because people are not taking care of themselves most of them having desk jobs now say 40 years back people never had neck pain because people wouldn't sit for so many hours but now, they did have desk jobs then doctor yeah but wouldn't spend so many hours working hard you see the most of the jobs that were 40 years plus were more outdoor jobs people wouldn't you know sit hours together in front of a monitor so the sitting job itself is a big uh, negative thing for back pain and neck pain and these people generally have a sedentary lifestyle so they put on weight again additional body weight causes back pain right that would affect your knees so if you have overweight it's a very simple rule if you put on 1 kilo it's not 1 kilo for the joint it's 1 into 4 So anything that you add is multiplied four times for the joint. Why? Why so four? So simply because you have to realize that your body weight at any given time, the joint is on one leg during your walking. Okay. So in a stance. Right. So it's sometimes when you're walking, if you're standing, your weight is distributed on both the both legs. Both the legs. But when you're walking at any given time in that cycle, you have joint force which is four times the body weight. So okay. you know that much of extra hammering of the joint occurs. So it's very important for me to. emphasize how much body weight makes a difference in causing a disease and to relieve the problem so my first thing to any patient is you need to lose weight and get to the ideal body weight ideal body weight is basically something that is designed by your height not by your age so depending on your height you are given a particular weight uh, range and that is your bmi which is called as a body mass index now if you are or and about that it's not only going to affect your joints but it's going to affect your other problems you might chance of getting diabetes if you're obese your chance of getting diabetes blood pressure so many cancers are so common if you are overweight so i think being overweight is one of the the worst things that can happen and that's why most of the orthopedic problems are related to being overweight right but um, like you rightly said earlier age also affects that yes so let's take my case i mean as i said 10 12 years ago i thought i was slim you know uh oh, now of course it's a different story but at that time i i thought i was slim but even at that time you sa- you asked me oh do you exercise i said yeah sometimes you asked me what exercise do you do and i remember telling you very proudly i walk okay i would do walk a lot and you said well walking is not enough I remember you saying this you know walking is not enough That's and enough. you need to you need to no, it's a, it's exercise a, it's a, more it's a, it's an excellent question because it opens up the pandora's box here now see it's when i said weight weight is not the only reason why you would be able to get all these diseases one of the things sometimes you see very overweight people and they don't have issues at right. the same time you have very thin people and they have issues so it's not just the weight it's one of weight is very important to be lost but important is the muscle strength So the next question is how do I lose my weight? Weight loss does not occur only by exercise. Weight loss occurs by diet. controlling your diet. So 80% of the effort has to be on nutrition. Now, exercise why is it important? Exercise does so many things. First, a person who exercises has a better mental state of mind. You know, chances of getting depressed is more positive. And you you see people who are regularly exercising and you see a guy who is having a sedentary lifestyle. Right. And they're different personalities. That's number 1. Second, exercises gives you a lot of strength i'm not just talking about physical strength it just gives you that attitude you know the way you walk the way you stand all this improves right. the way you sit and see people who exercises have less problems with their lower back and their necks because their posture is fine and see when you say exercise exercise has three or four components of fitness first is stamina which comes by doing any cardiovascular exercise then comes strength for which you need weight training either you can use free weights or you can use your own body, body weight. weight third is stretching extremely important part of any fitness so when they say doctor what exercises should i do i think you have to address all these three components that is strength stamina and flexibility so you could choose to cycle you could choose to walk see uh, running when people ask me can i run i said you can run but the chances of having a high impact you know injuries are much more so you can choose a sport to start with to improve your lose your body weight like maybe go get into the gym you can cycle you can walk on the treadmill do a little bit of weight training because weight training is an extremely part important part not only it gives you strength but moment your lean body mass improves you're burning calories even at rest and that's a very very important mm-hmm. thing so that you know you st- keep losing weight even if you're not exercising so strength training has to be an important part of your 
fitness program. You you also said something about stretching. I think we all know about exercises. We all know that we know, need to do cardiovascular exercises. But I think stretching has not been given that kind of importance that it really should, you know. So um, is y yoga isn't a yoga a type of stretching? Wouldn't Absolutely. you say that? Absolutely. I mean, if you can get yoga into your curriculum, then there's nothing like it. So if, if you say that, you know, I don't have time to go to the gym or don't have access to a gym, then I would say, you know, just do yoga. In fact, one of the best exercises in yoga is a Surya Namaskar. You know, Surya Namaskar is basically a combination of about 10 steps. And it's such a good exercise that... 12, you, I think. Uh, well, oh, it yes. depends on where you count. Right, okay. So, <laughs> uh, so you, don't, you go through the whole sequence. And when you start doing that exercise, you realize that it's not only addressing your strength, not only addressing your stamina, but also your flexibility. So it, it's one exercise, like a king of exercises, which you would do about, say, if you can do 50 <gasps> in a day, if no, you can achieve that, that you, I that's really, a lot. I don't know how yeah. many of you all can do 50. <laughs> I know I do well, like no, nothing 15. Nothing comes easy. And practice, it needs practice. I, I do 15 and yes. I'm like panting yes. and I'm yes. like, okay, I no, need well, to take a break. You can aim at 50. When you can start with 15 and end yes. at 50, there are some people who do 100, yeah, 108 they are. They are. to be precise. In fact, that's what is the recommendation. But what I'm saying is that it's, it's the mindset. It's not about exercising per se. You just need to, you know, not just sit at least one hour a day in the whole of the day, 24 hours, at least one hour you give it to yourself in terms of either, go, so, suppose you don't want to do anything, just go for a walk, that, that's good enough. So, you know, I just want people to accept one thing that exercise has to be part of their lifestyle. It cannot be done as a prescription or because you have put on weight. It's something that they should enjoy doing it. So I think that's, that's the message. I, I think so. And I'm feeling so happy <coughs> speaking to you because I walk and I'm feeling good now that I'm walking and I may not exercise all the time, but yes. Okay, um, a question, doctor. How do we de uh, detect arthritis early? Like, you know, what are the steps or what are the symptoms that we should be looking for? So whenever a patient complains of a joint pain, the things that, you know, make me alarmed that this could be something more serious is if the patient says, I've got a very uh, early morning stiffness, which lasts for at least half an hour. You know, where, so any, where well, would any, any joint, I mean, you have a knee joint, it could start with your knuckle joints, it could start with your knees, it could start with your feet. So arthritis can start from any joint. It doesn't sort of, uh, you know, you can choose. So I'm talking about the serious type, which is the rheumatoid arthritis. The general osteoarthritis generally affects the knees and the hips and the back. But again, here the first sign is pain. Second is stiffness. The stiffness which lasts for more than half an hour points that it is more of a inflammatory arthritis. If the stiffness is only for 5 to 10 minutes, it is an osteoarthritis. So this is the duration. So once, you know, I'm trying to suspect, okay, if that this patient may have an arthritis, I would ask for an x-ray. I would run down a few blood tests because now I want to know what sort of, uh, reason, what is the reason behind it? Whether it is just inflammation, whether it is a uric acid problem. So the, is that what you would be checking in the yes, blood test? Yes, so we would do a, uric uh, we have to do a range of blood tests. Right. We have to do a range of x-rays. And Based on the, see, basically at the end of the day, 90% of the diagnosis is made clinically based on the patient's symptoms. The x-rays and the blood tests are done just to confirm it. So right. there's not one particular test will tell you that it's a particular type of arthritis. It's basically a combination of all this that helps you to come to a diagnosis. All right. Um, <coughs> this is a personal question, I mean, for me. Um, when I wake up in the mornings, as soon as I put my feet down from the bed, you know, I'm not walking straight. I remember mentioning this to you some time ago. And you said, do you walk like a duck? And I said, yes, I do. You know, it just takes about a minute or so for, it to, for me to walk straight. I'm walking, you know, with my feet not straight. They're, they're a little bit at an angle. Why is that? Is that uh, age so, related? Yeah, no, so uh, most of the time, these uh, early morning pain that you get under the, especially the heel pad, you know, patients mm. actually sort of waddle. It's a waddling gait. You feel like you're a certain old person, but it's because of an inflammation called as the plantar fasciitis inflammation. Now, it's because basically when your body weight starts increasing, right. your calf muscles are overworking. So the calf muscles are an extension into the foot. Okay. So the foot fascia becomes very tight at rest. So the first step that you put down, it starts putting a stretch on that fascia. So it's painful. 
As you keep walking gradually, you've taken 10, 15 steps, yes. then the pain sort of settles down. That's because the calf muscle is now beginning to get stretched out. So what I tell patients is that the moment you get down, before you put your foot down, stretch your calf muscles, stretch your heel cord, and then start walking. It's a very simple exercise so that you, you could you do. Yeah, sort do of you could either put a towel and stretch it backwards, or you could do heel calf stretching. What, what, what's that, doctor? Heel calf uh, stretching? What, well, what exactly should basically one Basically, you're going to stand on the edge of a step yes. and then lower your heels down okay. and stretch your calf muscles. Okay. I mean, there are various ways of doing it, right. but calf stretching exercises would help a lot. But, but if you're waking up in the morning, like yeah. for example, my case, you, I've just woken up. And as I said, the moment I put my feet on the floor, you know, it's not flat. It, it is at an angle. So at that time, before I put my feet down, you are saying just on the bed itself. On the bed, you could stretch your calf muscles, you know, your ankle your, up and down, yeah. and then try and wrinkle your toes. That will help you to reduce it. But basically, what the whole thing is that the whole day, you need to do your calf stretching exercises so that you don't get this startup pain. It's called as a startup pain. So this, basically, the treatment for any plant, plantar fascia is, is basically exercise and of course weight loss the reason why it has happened okay so you're telling me in other words i need to lose weight okay i'm going to keep that in mind now we come to uh, my next question um there is salil naik who has asked what if we don't do actual i don't know what he means a surgery after injury that is i don't know what it means but i suppose it means what if we don't want to do actually surgery after an injury, what we, what what happens if we just want to skip? So the I understand surgery. what he's trying to say. So yes. see, it's like this: whenever there is a, there are certain injuries that occur, and doctors would recommend uh, a surgical procedure for any particular injury, it's always if it's a good idea for the patient that he needs to get a second opinion. Right. I think it's something that I always proactively tell my patients right. because see nowadays there is so much of information available for the patient, right. and they really don't know what's the right thing to do. So I always explain exactly. to them that, you know, you've got a particular X problem, then this is the best option. Most important for me is I give the patients options. I don't tell them you have to do this or it is a must. Right. I explain the pros and cons and based on that, the patients have to make a decision. Right, right. And if they are in doubt, they should go and have a second opinion. I think that's the safest thing to do for the patient. Right. And also another thing, I, I'm i sure peop uh, there are lots of people out there like me the moment doctor you know suggests some treatment i go online and i want to do a lot of reading and i want to know a lot about it but i've also realized i uh, may be not true for everyone but for me it is you know you read something on the internet and it puts a lot of fear into you because you are thinking the worst i mean you're thinking that means i have to go for knee replacement so uh, would you recommend your patients to go online and check a lot of, uh, you know? Well, see, whether I tell them to do it or not, they've either done it before or they're going to do it afterwards. So if I'm, I feel them that I'm part of their team, I, make, I want to make them feel that, okay, I'm part of a team, I'm thinking for you, and let's make this decision together. That's how I look at it. So it's, it's, it's not that whether you're going to get, so if he's worried about something that he has read, he can always come back and discuss it with me. So at the end of the day, it's the professional who is going to advise you to do the correct decision. It's right. like if you have, you're going to build a home, you can't build it by yourself. You need right. an architect, you need an engineer. You need the inputs from all these people to get the best outcome. Similarly, for any treatment, I think you have to first trust your doctor. That's the key thing. If you don't trust him, then it, nothing else matters. The second thing, you have to be well informed. So today's way the medicine is practiced all over the world is that the patient has to be a well informed patient. And we have found that patients who are well informed, the outcomes are always better because the patient cooperates in the treatment, patient understands the pros and cons. I know if something goes wrong once in a while, he just doesn't put the blame on the doctor, which happens all the time. Because these are the people who have not been clearly indicated about, because every surgical procedure has its complications. So if you have discussed this frankly with the patient and explained to him everything in detail, there shouldn't be an issue. So when you're saying the patient needs to be well informed, so the doctor needs to inform the patient, yes, right? Yes. This is what you absolutely, are saying. Absolutely. And, the, and also the patients, I think, need to ask questions of their doctors and their yes. surgeons. Because I think uh, a decision like a surgery has to be taken, you know, from both sides. Yes. It cannot be one-sided that yes. my doctor has said, and, you know, I'm going to do that. Yes. Am I right, doctor? Absolutely. Correct me absolutely. if I'm wrong. Absolutely. absolutely. Right? Okay. Um, another question. <coughs> a lot of highs and... Okay, this is 
Girish Vele Puas is the combination of oh my goodness he has used uh, some drug Ito, Itori Coxib and Theo Col Chicoside. Chicoside drug um, contraindicated in heart disease and does it lead to significant weight loss Girish you I'm sure you know a lot about this because it took me uh, quite some time to actually pronounce uh, these drugs. Okay, doctor, can you help Girish Velip with this, please? So, I think he's just worried about drug combinations. And what, what exactly is So, basically, this, drug, this is a painkiller with a muscle relaxant. This is a uh, this is a drug that is commonly prescribed for any musculoskeletal pain. You have the, you have a back pain or a neck pain. Now, the problem with any medication is that people usually self-prescribe. So, so, if any... If, suppose if I prescribe a medicine and that patient feels better, he sometimes they choose not to come back and they sort of continue taking the treatment because many of these drugs are today available over the counter. Right. Even if they are not available, they somehow get access to it. Now, any drug that is taken, any drug, say a, drink, a drug like paracetamol, simple right. drug, if you keep taking it and if you've been also taking some other drugs, that could be drug interactions, there could be side effects, and those side effects can affect your body. So I would feel that you shouldn't first of all self-prescribe. You shouldn't take more than what your doctor has prescribed. And if there is any complication that occurs during the course of treatment, you should come back to the doctor so that you know things can be stopped. There is nothing like an absolutely safe medicine. Any medicine can either do good as well as it can do harm. Because there's always something called as a collateral damage. Right. So you have to be extremely careful about self-medication. Right. So. Girish, I hope that uh, that is uh, that doctor has answered your question. Can you tell us, uh, says Marvin Kota, uh, can you tell us some relaxing exercises? Well, relaxing is a very subjective uh, yes, it experience. Is. <laughs> uh, what is good for one and but generally, yeah, generally I feel that stretching is a very good way of relaxing. Any stretching exercises that you would, you know, especially if you have a back pain problem, something like uh, Bhujangasan or a Cobra posture or doing a downward dog stance any stretching is really relaxing sometimes people just go on a you know walk on the beach and they are relaxed or right. just listening to music so i think relaxing is very subjective but i think i understand what he's trying to say so stretching is something that you just to start with before doing any exercises because that sort of wakes up your muscle maybe it's jogging on this uh, spot a little bit of stretching that would help a lot so you are saying that one hour of exercises minimum is enough for a person every day is it possible to break it up like half an hour you know there are so many people who are working <coughs> of course now they are working from home but during normal times i'm sure most of you all have you know like me must be in a hurry you as a woman you also have to do the cooking you have to do the household chores and there is no time to exercise so is it possible for you know for us to do like half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening i'm just asking is that is Absolutely. that okay i mean as, as long as you're doing your one and a half or one hour of exercise every day even if you break it up into two it's like if you eat your meal you know one meal a day and you sort of break it up into two meals or maybe three meals it's fine but if you're going to over exercise you're going to say exercise one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon too much of exercise also can cause problems. Damage, of course. Now, first thing you need to understand that what is the reason you're exercising. If you're exercising to lose weight, I think the major emphasis has to be on your kitchen and what you eat, what you buy and what you eat. See, I have, I've known a people who, who can exercise for three hours a day and they just don't watch don't what they eat. Weight. And so you're not going to lose weight. You will get healthier, but you just don't lose weight. So if your target is not weight loss, you want to gain weight then probably you need to get into weight training, you need to add, you know, add more nutrition, add more proteins. So all these things have to be tailor-made based on what is your requirement. But generally for a good health, an hour of walking or an hour of cycling or an hour of swimming, any safe cardio exercises is good enough. And okay. yoga, of course, if it's raining, on a rainy day you don't want to go out, yes. I mean, just start doing yoga in the home. Right. So it's, it's just that it's the mindset. You, you can't be finding excuses not yes. to do it. And if you have to do it, then and you've, you will got, a find whole, a you've way. got a whole range. You will it. find yes. a way, yes. any which way. Th that's right. Um, next question, doctor. Uh, you, I think you have answered this. How does lifestyle affect the incidence of orthopedic health issues? So I think uh, you have partly answered yeah. that. So I would rather say that I'll, I'll give you a solution. I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to get outdoors. 
By getting outdoors, I mean you need to expose yourself to sunlight. Because today, another biggest problem that we see is vitamin D deficiency. And that simply comes from the fact, one fact, that we hardly go out. We hardly expose ourselves to sun. So you require at least in half an hour of exposure to sunlight in not fully covered clothes, but at least in a t-shirt so that your maximum skin gets exposed to sunlight. So that's rule number one, is to get outdoors. Secondly, exercise. As I said, you know, you need to be exercising every day. It doesn't matter what sort of exercise you do, whatever sort of suits your personality. Third is watching what you eat. One of the things that has sort of uh, come up in the recent times, but it's always been there for many years, is fasting. So I would strongly recommend people that intermittent fasting is one great way to start, you know, controlling your urge to eat itself. And fasting does a wonderful thing. In fact, this has come from one of the Japanese scientists. They have found that people who fast, their immune system starts sort of upgrading. You know, it sort of gets into a better mode. So one of the best ways to improve your immunity, especially within COVID times, is to fast as much as you can. It, it, it's something very, it sounds very difficult to understand, but you know, it, the body moment it goes into a fasting mode, it undergoes what is a process called as autophagy. Where Auto? is the autophagy. Fetchy. Autophagy means basically these damaged proteins in the cells are repairing by themselves. So body is getting better moment it is given rest. See, fasting is a state of rest, isn't it? Right. So moment you rest your GI system, so if you say in a 24 hours, you don't eat for 16 hours, for that 16 hours, body is repairing itself. But you have to give that 16 hours of uninterrupted rest. So you don't eat anything. You can only drink water, green tea or black coffee in those 16 hours. So okay. either you can skip your breakfast or you can skip your dinner. This, this is a very simple way of not only, it is not only good to lose weight, but to improve your health, overall health. So fasting is very good. The second thing that is, you know, is a good hormetic stressor to improve your immunity nowadays is if somebody is not used to taking a cold water shower, they should try that. These are hormetic stresses. I've, they I've sort of, heard, in fact, yes, a, a cold lot water about bath it. Yes. is an excellent way of, you know, improving, trying to improve your immunity. So it's like this: eat less, exercise in moderation, sleep well. Sleep is one of those things which is always underrated. Inadequate sleep creates lots of issues. In fact, one of the common reasons for weight gain is inadequate sleep and drinking less water. So the basic things have to be right. So enough of sleep. When I say enough of sleep. It has to be a good six to eight hours of sleep. Generally, when we say six to eight hours, it's not that just lying down. You have to go really go into a deep sleep. If you get that two, three hours of deep sleep, even the four hours of sleep is enough. Yes. Practice people who practice yoga, like our Prime Minister Mr. Modi, he sleeps for four hours and he's so active. So it's a subjective thing, but rest is extremely important. So do not neglect, you know, the power of sleep, the power of drinking water. Water. People shouldn't neglect these things, basic things. I mean, you can, we can talk about a lot of hi-fi things, but if, as long as the basics are not right, things are not going to improve. Right. Uh, you spoke about, and you have been speaking a lot about exercising. Um, you know, forgive me for saying so, but it looks like you, you, you actually, it's a compliment that you exercise as well. I mean, how, how well, <coughs> I remember well, you will, telling me yeah. that you do every day. For me, exercise is not about, you know, it's something that has become part of my lifestyle. Right. Uh, if really, actually, if I had put more efforts on my diet, probably I would have lost a lot of more weight. But I can tell you, at, I'm 53 years old, but I don't feel older at all. I mean, one of the advantages of exercise itself is that it keeps you young, not only in physical state, but also your mental state. So for me, physical exercise is something that I would never stop ever doing it. Because that's something that I've been, because I've been a sportsman all my life. Right. I've, I, in fact, I've represented uh, Goa in cricket as well as in badminton. Okay. So it's something that's something is part of me. Now it's very important that as we grow older, we exercise more on a regular basis. So it's like if you are 20 and 25, you have never exercised, body might forgive you. But once you cross 40 and you're into those 50s, exercise is your savior. Take it from me. If you want to spend less bills, you know, money on doctor's medicine. bills and medicines and hospitalization in your 60s and 70s, you better start exercising. That's the one thing that's going to keep you afloat. Right. It's going to improve your immunity, your chances of, you know, in the present times of COVID times, somebody who exercises on a regular basis has less chances of getting an infection. And even if it does get, you know, getting complications would be much, much less. So I think people have to start looking at improving their immunity and exercise is one of the keys. Right, right.
I wanted to ask this question to you. I mean, maybe uh, I've been misinformed, but um, especially women, you know, once uh, you get into menopause, they say uh, that the bones become a little more brittle. Uh, they are weaker. Um, also, they say jogging is not recommended. Would you say that's true? I mean, jogging <coughs> for... So, uh, let me answer the first part of the question. Yes, after 40. Uh, I think postmenopausal osteoporosis, or which is you know, once the osteoporosis that sort of there is a surge in loss of bone strength immediately postmenopausal, is something that you have to start looking before menopause hits you. So, before, say you're in your 40, 40s and you're going to normally get a menopause at 45. So you start working on your physical strength, you're exercising five years before. So that at 45 when it strikes, you are much prepared for preventing that bone loss. So it's like preventing the bone loss. You have to prevent that bone loss which occurs as a part of your normal physiology. Sunlight, exercise, good nutrition, and maintaining your body weight are the keys. There are lots of medications that are available. I can take a calcium, vitamin D, yes, I was supplements. Getting to that. You can take lots of supplements, but the power of those medicines is only 30%. 70% is your diet, your body weight, and your exercise, you know. So it's basically all bogs down to one thing is that it's how you have prepared yourself for the next 10 years. So right. you can't sort of get into trouble and then get out of trouble. You stay out of trouble by preventing the effects of normal physiological changes. So okay. as far as you said, the, what was the second part of your question? That jogging, that jogging. you know, okay. uh, so because jogging, it's, uh, yeah. it's a lot of um, weight on your knees. Yeah. So and I generally tell people that if you are overweight, you shouldn't start getting into Zumba and jogging because, you know, these are high impact exercises. It's okay. I mean, if somebody has been doing Zumba for a long time, you're in your ideal body weight, it's not a problem. But generally, chances of getting a sports injury like damaging your ligaments, your cartilage are much higher on any impact sports. It could be whether it could be badminton, it could be jogging, it could be Zumba, it could be marathon running. Nowadays, marathon running has become a, you know, a fashion. There's nothing wrong in doing a marathon, but you have to prepare yourself you gradually. To you have to train slowly. That's true. It, it applies to any sports. So otherwise, if you don't do that, you, you're going to land up with injuries. I so it's, that's not, I've got nothing against jogging per se. You, first thing is you shouldn't jog on a very hard surface to start with. You have to use good proper shoes. And third, look at your body weight and then decide and train slowly and gradually and reach the level that you want to. What do you mean by not on a hard surface? Like what so surface hard surface like just say? walking on the, road? on the roadside is to start with, you know, especially if you're going to, you know, you've never done that before, the chance of getting a stress fracture, especially you're going to run for a long time, then these issues come up. But, you know, as body is very resilient, if you go to train someone to walk on a hard surface, with the right amount of ec proper equipment, then it's easy. So where would, where, what would you recommend? Where do we start? So you, you can start jogging on the treadmill. Treadmill is the safest thing because it's a cushioned deck. So the chances of you getting any injuries are less. Or you can just jog on the ground where this so soil is a little softer. Okay. So, so don't start jogging on the road. What about the beach? We have so many beach beaches. Beach is good, but the problem with the beach is the beach is always on an incline. If you have a beach which is flat, and you know surface right. is firm you could join but generally when you see a beach especially in the monsoon times it's, it's sort of eroded yes. it's sort of slope yes. and if you start walking on an incline you go to injure your ankle okay another question that has come to mind is you know um, like i said uh, i walk i like walking i do a lot of walking i have been told by someone who does a lot of walking herself and she said you know you should not walk on an incline because it puts a lot of pressure on the lower back is that true i mean should one <coughs> not walk uh well see it's like this to start with walk on a flat okay. if you want to sort of increase your gradually you want to increase the the intensity of exercise going uphill downhill only for a part of your walk is good enough but specifically, if you have an issue with your lower back, then we recommend that you don't walk uphill or downhills, because then you can put an extra stress on your ba lower back or in your kneecaps. Right. But it's 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 not like uh, you know a complete no. It's something that you know you have to. It's like saying should you jog or not jog? Of course you can jog, but you have to take care of all these things. Safety comes. I think in any exercise, safety comes first, and the safety is decided by the person, especially if you have a good physical trainer. There's nothing like it. So, you know, you have to be professional. In anything you do, don't try to experiment yourself. If you go to a gym, get a good instructor, gradually build up. And see, the thing is, it's all about need-based. If you're going to tell your gym instructor, you know, I want to lose 10 kilos in three months, and he's going to put you through the grind. Because for him, you know, you're a client who's asking for a specific. 
but in that three months you're going to injure yourself so don't look at short-term targets you know anything that you do it should be on one year program and it should be well planned and well planned you know in phases yes. not just to, right Absolutely. now everybody wants to be slim and look good so yes our next question we I'll just check uh, lots of questions have come in lots of questions have come in okay we have Vinu Mahale which asks, doctor what are the uh, exercises for sciatica yeah so basically the word sciatica comes from the word uh, you know sciatic nerve which is a nerve coming from your lower back goes okay. around to your leg now if there is a disc prolapse so is it from the lower back to the yeah, back so of basically your from the spinal cord right the bunch of nerve roots the one of the nerve, this five roots they join together and form a big nerve going down to the leg that is at the back of your leg yes the back right. of the leg right okay. from the lower back through your buttocks goes right down to your foot now if there is any pressure on the nerve root in the spine by either a small growth or a small disc which is pressing it will give rise to symptoms along your leg now whenever a thing like this occurs we basically tell the patient the first thing they need to take is two or three days of rest rest once that acute pain has settled down we put them through certain exercises one of the very common exercises that is bhujangasana is like the cobra posture that is a very safe exercises to do but i think before doing the exercise by themselves they should consult the doctor because sometimes certain exercises can aggravate the pain absolutely so it is very important that they don't again just like self medication they don't start exercising by themselves it is first important that they see the uh, concerned doctor right and then start the treatment right right um so what are the exercises you've just told her and the treatment for and is there any treatment um, for sciatica that is she is i think it is vino yeah I, it, I don't know if we know you're a male or female I'm just saying we know. Yeah, it doesn't matter uh, because yes. the treatment is the same so <laughs> okay. uh, so basically I think it's what she's trying to, he or she is trying to find out is that is there anything else that can be done well if exercises don't help generally uh, the good news is that for most back pains that come to us 90% of them get better in a matter of six weeks so okay. I tell my patients that for six weeks don't try to do anything more than that's required like people would come and say for the first three four days like the back pain i want to do an mri scan it's, it's just a waste of money and you know effort so we shouldn't just jump the wagon and try and do right. things i have no patients who come to me with the mri done you know just because they said oh no i was worried so, you know the worry is a problem everything there's a lot of anxiety nowadays people either self-medicate or they self-treat or they would do investigations on their own which is not a really a good thing to do because at the end of the day this would create lots of anxiety and problems so i tell the patient that if there's any back pain take a rest take a few anti-inflammatories if you're requiring use an ice pack locally do certain basic exercises if these things don't help then we can go and do the investigations now suppose the patient turns out to be having a slip disc you know a disc prolapse which comes out i think still again he, this patients also need surgery is only in five to ten percent of the cases so surgery is not really the you know quick fix solution so what is the solution for slip disc for example as i said slip disc is something that is a natural process it the once a disc comes out over a period of time the disc shrinks and it settles down now what is the treatment basically you start treating the cause what was the cause of the slip disc was the weak muscle so it all boils down back Exercise. to strengthening your lower back improving your core you know there is a exercise program called as pilates yes focus basically focuses on strengthening your core muscles, core muscles. so you have to address all these things and yoga of course i mean yoga is the panacea for all these issues yes but it has to be done on a long term you can't just say do it for six weeks and say oh i'm done i'm fine so once you have a back pain the chances of you getting it again are very high so you must use exercise as the you know the major thing against lower back pain i you know um I I do suffer from chronic backache. I do uh, yoga whenever the pain occurs. Of course, I do the yoga, which is wrong. I know, and I should do it all the time. But I'm sure there are a lot of viewers who do the same thing. I ask my daughter to stand on my back, and believe it or not, I get a lot of relief. Now, I'm sure you're going to tell me it's wrong, and I shouldn't be so doing it. So let me ask you the question: Is what I always ask my patients? I said, Do you want pain relief or you want a problem relief? If you want pain relief, you can take a painkiller, you can take a massage, you can ask your child to sit on the top of your back and, you know, hammer it down. But is that going to solve your problem? 
So the problem lies in the strength, why at all it did occur. So you have to exercise to relieve your problem, not your pain. If you fix the problem, the pain is sorted out. But if you keep fixing the pain and you don't address the problem, then you're going to be a chronic back pain patient. So it's a choice you have to make. So again here, it's, it's very important for us to counsel these patients. For me, it's about counseling the patient and making them understand that what the problem is. Because once they're out of my clinic, I have no control over them. So I need to make the maximum impact on their patient's mind in those 10 minutes of consultation, explaining them what is the cause of this problem and how you're going to deal with the problem. I mean, pain relief, you could just go to a pharmacy and buy a painkiller. You don't right. need to come to me. You can take an injection and you feel fine. So if you see the worker class people, they, they don't want to even understand what their problem is because they, it's beyond them. They just say, fix my pain. And, you know, that's their mindset. But if you're educated and you can understand what I think you need to understand that. And again, the commitment for getting better has to be on your side. I can only guide you. At the end of the day, it depends on what you do with your body. Whether you're exercising, whether you're eating no, right. No, but you had given me some exercise. <coughs> As I said, you know, when I had come once for the backache and you say the the cobra position. Yes. I remember you saying that and that does help. So those who are having backache, I mean, besides uh, going and meeting with your doctor, I'm sure I'm telling you from experience that this does help a lot, in fact, tremendously. Uh, could, we are going to the next question, doctor. There is Raju Ramamurthy. I live on the fifth floor of my building. I don't use a lift while coming downstairs and also while going up to the fifth floor. Is that also good exercise? Raju, before doctor can answer, I'm telling you, that's amazing because I use the lift whenever possible, even though I know walking up the steps is a good thing. Yes, doctor, uh, can you answer uh, Raju, one, please? I think one thing you can tell about Raju is that he's not a very lazy fellow. So, you know, congratulations, Raju, you're, you're doing a great job. Raju's giving me a complex. <laughs> okay, yes. So I think, I mean, climbing stairs or getting down stairs, it's, it's, if you have bad knees, per se, and yeah. you are overweight, then anyway, you're going to be finding it difficult to do it. But if you can do it comfortably, don't, don't stop doing it. Right. See, life is motion, and motion is life. Absolutely. So if you can keep moving, there's nothing better than that. So, you know, there's no two things about, I mean, exercise is again. How about dancing? Excellent. In fact, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, I had been to China three, four years ago. And I've seen these old couples there, you know, either they're doing Tai Chi or they're just doing street dancing. Tai Chi is that yeah, this, this just rhythmic that movement, movements, right? Yes. yes. So that improves your... So in fact, this is one point that I would like to make to all the senior citizens. Generally, people think that, you know, once I'm 65, 70, exercise is not my cup of tea and it's something that's going to cause more harm. In fact, it's the other way around. The older you get, the more important that you need a formal exercise every day. Now, the reason is that, you know, you have to understand, people are worried about losing their bone strength. Right. But most important is losing your skeletal muscle mass. So, let me put a question. You know, I asked, what is the first time you feel that you're getting old? You know, when you have difficulty getting off the chair itself, you know, you have to use effort. Right. That's the first sign that your buttock muscles are gone out of function. The strength for anything to walk and stand comes from your buttock muscles. So, strengthening exercises are extremely important. Secondly is your balance. You know, once you're 65, 70, you, you start losing your balance and people yes. have falls. Yes. Now, tai Chi is an excellent exercise because it sort of helps you to improve your coordination. So, this, as I said, you know, these Chinese old couples, they dance, they do Tai Chi exercises. This helps them to keep themselves young. And the chances of getting injuries in your old age are much less. Right. So, I would again, right. as I said, strongly recommend that the elderly population, please listen, exercise is something that is going to keep you alive longer and healthier right so all those who are listening and especially the senior citizens you have it right from the doctor's mouth that exercises are the best way to keep yourself you know moving and agile lively happy also um, our next question doctor uh, Parnita Dixit hi good afternoon very true doctor very thorough practical information Bujang us you also recommended uh, Bhujang Asan and thank you very much. So I think, Parnita, uh, you must be doing the Bhujang Asan and that's why. Godfrey Fernandez asks, does statin intake affect the bo muscle bone? Yeah, so... Uh, Doctor, first, what yeah. is statin? Yeah, statins I, are I, basically I drugs that are given for high cholesterol levels and high tri triglyceride levels. Um, this is a question I can only answer partially because I am not the expert on cholesterol. But I know for sure that patients who are put on statins 
can get some sort of a musculoskeletal pain. They doesn't, it doesn't happen in all the patients, but if it does happen, they should go back to their physician and they can change the drug. So I think that's what the advice is. All right. That's Godfrey, I hope uh, doctors answered your question, doctor. Um, what are some of the recent advances in orthopedic treatment? We just have ten min nine minutes to be precise, and there are so many other questions that we, uh, you know, I have. Of course, it's been lovely. I'm sure all of you sitting and listening and viewing us must be thinking also very interesting. Doctor is giving us great tips, and my the question again: What are the recent advances <coughs> in orthopedic treatment that will change the future? So I think. Uh, the modern science that is uh, the way it's progressing we are getting into more and more of minimally invasive surgery so the size of the surgical incisions are getting smaller what it simply means for the patient is that it is less injury and faster recovery so you're doing the same surgery that you used to do through big incisions through small incisions so less hospital stay less chances of infection so basically the surgical techniques are evolving not just because of the skills of the surgeon but of better instruments, the better technology that has come into the picture, the ability for the surgeon to visualize, you know, suppose, let me give an example. Today, I can plan my surgery before the surgery starts by designing the complex fracture on a 3D model. So I just need to get that CT scan, give it to the machine, the machine will recreate that, and so I can plan my surgery well right. to the last perfection. Right. So right. one is that it helps in planning, Secondly, in executing the surgery in the quickest time. And the other advance that is occurring and probably in five, ten years is something that is the uh, growth of growing the cartilage in you know, artificial tissue engineering, it's called as. Okay. So we are using tissues, artificial tissues to get better bone growth so that you make, you know, healing of the bone is improved. Right. We can also grow cartilage in the laboratory now and also we can grow it into the human body. So if somebody has lost a portion of the cartilage that can be regrown. Okay. So again, genetic engineering, again, genes, you can modify the genes and certain diseases which we can stop from occurring, occurring. certain congenital problems right. or development problems. So research is definitely getting uh, into ways of not just trying to cure, but also but to also prevent. But also prevent, of course. Because, and of course, the uh, in terms of the amount of uh, the metallurgy, you know, the metallurgy has really changed. The type of implants that we are using are much more stronger, much more uh, human friendly. Chances of, you know, breaking or corrosion are much less. So I think it's it's a huge gamut. It's not just one right. factor. So I think joint replacement surgery, I mean, joint replacement surgery is the surgery of the decade. I mean, it has really created such a huge change in the quality of life of patients. For people. Because yes. it has taken away their pain, it has restored them, their mobility. And it's given them normal function. That's the most important thing. And they and can resume. And they're off medications. And, and they're they, off medications. And they can resume some of the the, the jobs that yes, they do, yes, or you know, everyday yes, tasks. Yes, I just think the quality of life absolutely. has improved tremendously. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. All right, um, doctor. One question that uh, you know I, I have forgotten to ask you right from the beginning: um, fractures when they happen. I mean, you're talking about so much of advances. Is there any advances uh, or advancement in um, you know, fractures and fracture treatment? Uh. Yes, I mean, when I started training, and at that time, if a 70-year-old lady came to me with a broken hip, these chances of this lady surviving that fracture was not very good. Today, I can confidently say that a 70-year-old or 80-year-old lady with a broken hip or a broken wrist or a broken spine, we operate them as early as possible, and they are made to walk the next day of the surgery in 95% of the cases. Now, that must be painful. That's, uh, well, pain is something that is managed by the anesthetist so well today. So pain management, again, is one area which has really improved tremendously. And that has, again, allowed Health, us to yes. sort of get the patients up of and about course. quickly. Now, the advantage of doing that is, is that patients who have fractures at that age tend to have less complications. And the post-operative complications are much, much less because they recover faster, they stand up faster. So the chances of getting a bed sore or a chest infections are much less, a chance of getting a, you know, like a deep vein thrombosis, like a clot in your leg, all these chances are so less. Infection, infections are so low because now we use these laminar airflow theaters. What's so that? Laminar airflow theater is basically a theater where the air that comes in is ultra filtered. It's like a HEPA filter air. So, so you know, the chance of, like so the amount of, 
so there is almost zero bacteria in the air okay. so the chance very of sterile in, absolutely basically. sterile yes right. we use special space suits when you are operating oh, so okay. technology has really you know helped us not only get the patient better quickly but it also helps us to you know it's safer to do it you know at the age of 90 if you tell me how safe it is to get a surgery done on the hip it's very safe it's as 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 good as probably doing a cataract today so you right. know i mean something that was not heard of not like heard of. 20 and, and years and ago 35 40 years ago yes. we lost a lot of patients even you know the chances of uh, the amount of bleeding that used to occur the amount of complications because and people the technology itself was not there and secondly the surgeons did not have the understanding that you know we could do it better today we know that it's we can do it right. so you know it's all, only going to get better as the years pass by okay and um, what is the best treatment for osteoporosis in women so i think once you have already have established osteoporosis there is usually a combination of certain medicines but one of the common things that is used are basically called as bisphosphonates basically these are drugs which prevent could you repeat that bisphosphonates bisphosphonates are a class of drugs which are basically used to prevent osteoporosis or loss of bone from occurring right you also get these injections now which are created from the parathyroid gland and those are also helps that that injection also helps to build up bone so there are a lot of uh, you know array of treatments that are now available depending on the severity of the osteoporosis and the patient's other medical condition the doctor would prescribe this uh, medicines so uh, at what age can can a woman uh, take these injections that you so spoke about so it's not the age it's basically at what severity. yeah in the severity of your because there are women at 60 who have bones of a right. 40 year old and you have women at 40 who have bones of 60 year old so right. it depends on where you stand in the right the spectrum right there is um, <coughs> there is uh, vinu again vinu mahale okay i can see the picture vinu i'm sorry i did not see the picture earlier so vinu is a young man and uh, vinu as doctor my cousin is getting joint pains and she is just 30 she is on steroid injections and after the course her pain surface uh, surfaces so what is the so i suppose she takes the medicine and after some time vinu i suppose that's what Uh, you're saying and what is the remedy for it so doctor so looking at her age and the she's medicine 30. she's taking it looks yeah. like rheumatoid arthritis now rheumatoid arthritis is a disease which needs to be treated lifetime rule number 1 you can't cure it okay so and that's steroids it's only steroids is only one part of the treatment which deals with the pain if she keeps taking steroids and he doesn't take the treatment for the rheumatoid per se she is not going to get better so right. it's very important to understand that steroids only deals with the pain it doesn't deal with the problem and steroids are used but for a very short time till we tide over the crisis and the medicines that are being used take over and improve the disease so she has to do so she has to take both the treatments she has to see a orthopedic surgeon and or a rheumatologist and go ahead and get it sorted yes. out um you have spoken about na- neck and back pain and what are the exercises that you know you would recommend for neck back and of course the finger and the thumb pain that to most of us have well, i'm sure I, i think i don't want to trespass into the area of a physiotherapist in fact if any exercises are recommended they have to go and see their physical therapist or the physiotherapist and do not neglect my whole advice is do not neglect physical therapy don't try to do it by yourself don't try to say oh those are simple things i can do them by myself right. you must see the physiotherapist because it's a very important part of the treatment and do not neglect it generally patients would say oh give me some medicine i have no time to go to the physiotherapist i think that's a very wrong attitude physiotherapists are trained people they are trained professionals they know what they are doing right and visiting them and taking the right treatment i think is the key i think doctor we have about just about that we finish uh, for for today and we hope to see you again thank you so much you have given us thank you very so much. many tips and it has been really interesting to speak to you and to all of you out there exercise exercise enough of water good sleep i'm sure even meditation doctor yes uh, is there and thank you for joining us we are going to see you soon till then stay happy stay safe bye